welcome back to Smith Coding and Design. So today I wanted to go over the Pearson palette I've been working on. I did run into some struggles, so we'll cover those. And again, those are all on me, just sort of learning about my machine, getting familiar with it, and understanding what my Silex 7 can handle. Again, I do have the LNC 6800 version, which is only four horsepower. So we'll get to see some cool videos where I stall my spindle and bog it down while doing some drilling ops and some roughing ops. So we'll get into that. So again, just a high level overview. So this Pearson palette is going to allow me to take a Saunders Machine Works 12 by eight fixture and mount it to the top here. So that way I can still use my mod vices. What we have here are four, four threaded holes that are one half 13 and then four holes sort of in the corner here that are four half inch dowel pins. So there's not much to it other than that. And so what I am going to do is in the comment section, I'm going to make available a Pearson palette fixture I made for a six by 10 palette. So again, you can go ahead and sort of put your palette inside of the stock and then go ahead and machine it. And I'll show you how I'm doing that here in a minute. I'm also making a Pearson fixture with an eight by 14 palette on it available. And again, this does have the point so you can set your origin, you know, the center of the round pin and at the face top face of one of the pads. And then finally, I'm making available uh, the Pearson palette I'm machining myself. That way, if you, like me, want to use your mod vices that you may have purchased, you know, with a previous machine, in my case, it was a Tormach. I actually had the Saunders fixture plate, but since my Sile X7, I believe the spindle nose only goes down to about six inches above the table. I still want to be able to use my mod vices and it, I wouldn't be able to do that if I just purchased the fixture plate again because my spindle is so high above the table. So instead what I'm doing is just taking an existing Saunders palette I had and mounting it on top of a Pearson palette and we'll see that in the videos and in the machining. So again, this, it, this worked out beautifully, you know, once I got through the struggles of machining it and, you know, learning what my Silo X7 can handle. So you'll see that at the end of the video too. And again, all this stuff will be available for you guys to go ahead and pull that if you want to, you know, use the same fixtures or even make the same palette. All right, so with that being said, let's go ahead and get into the cam. All right, so to start here, we do a 3D adaptive clearing where I am just removing about an inch from each side of the palette to match the 12 inches in length that the Saunders palette that I'm mounting on top is. Again, this Pearson palette is 8 by 14. So it was a little bit of a struggle just making sure that I had the Pearson palette as centered on my table as I could because the travel of the X7 is listed in the manual being 15.75 inches, which leaves me with less than an inch on either side of the 14 inch pallet. So again, that was something I had to work around. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and jump in here. So what I have shown here are what I consider the good feeds and speeds. So I'm using for this operation, a half inch helical three flute end mill. And so what I started at when I began machining was at about four thousand four thousandths per tooth, which made my feed rate right around 96 inches per minute. It turns out that that was not a good idea. So I did finish one side of the roughing before using the feed rate override to slow down the feed rate to around 50 inches per minute, which gives us right at around again that tooth out per tooth mark <clears throat> so this so again when i was about you know fourth out per tooth 96 inches per minute i did bog down my spindle and for context here the depth of cut is an inch and a quarter and my optimal load was 10 percent the diameter of the tool so that was 50 thousands and so again we'll see that in the video just didn't sound good to me and so again, lowering the feed rate to, 
you know, around 50 inches per minute. The machine did fine after that. So that's really it for the adaptive clearing. Then we get into just a couple 2D contours where I come and I clean up the sides where I removed all of the material with the adaptive clearing. So there's nothing much to see here. So the facing operation is interesting. So I've started using a lot of Haas tooling just because I think the performance per dollar is there. If you guys have ever had the chance to go browse the Haas tooling and even, you know, I personally purchased the Winter Circle so I get the free next day shipping and the 5% off. And so what I have here is a Haas Indexel end mill. It is three quarters of an inch in diameter. And again, one of the challenges here is I have less than an inch on either side, on either side of my pallet. So that's why I did the adaptive clearing first. So after I did that, I could have used my show mill, but really what I wanted to do was test out this new indexal end mill I got from Haas. And again, this thing just ate material. I mean, we'll just go in here and look at the speeds and feeds. So I am at 50% the diameter of the tool in terms of step over and I started out at 112 inches per minute granted I am only at 50 thousandths depth of cut but I was literally turning the feed rate override up and I was going over 130 inches per minute you know with this facing operation using this end mill and it didn't even phase the machine so I think I'm going to experiment with larger depths of cut later just to get the MMR up. And this might end up being my go-to roughing end mill moving forward for aluminum. Just because, again, since it is an indexable end mill, you know, carbide's cheaper. All I have to do is buy the inserts. So I think it, it might be a win-win. So that's the story behind this. And you'll get to see that in the video at the end after we sort of go through all the cam. So let's keep moving forward. So now we go into some drill operations. All I'm doing here is I'm taking a three quarter spot drill and I'm just, you know, spot drilling with a depth of 50 thousands from the top of the hole. So that's not a big deal. So now here's where, where I got a little crazy. So we'll go ahead and we'll look at this operation. So I'm using a kin metal go drill and it's almost a half of an inch in diameter and I'm at 4,000 RPM and I'm just sending it at 30 inches per minute. I was able to complete all of the holes. No, with no real issue other than, you know, I did feel like the spindle was bogging down as it got toward the bottom of the hole. Granted again, you know, the material here is an inch and a quarter thick. So I think next time I might peck instead of just doing a, you know, what do they call this? A wrap it out. So instead of just going all the way through and then wrapping it out, I might peck next time or I might experiment with just, you know, reducing the plunge feed rate by half or something of that nature. Again, just didn't like the sound as it got toward the end you know, maybe that's right where it's sort of breaking out of the material. It looks like it started to, sounds like it started to bog my spindle up. And again, guys, feel free to, you know, post any of your concerns or recommendations in the comments, you know, especially if you have a sile with the LNC controller, you know, I'd love to hear from you guys what your recommendations are. Again, I am, you know, just still trying to get used to the machine. So next we move into just a boring operation. So again, I am... I drilled these holes with the kin of metal drill and now I'm just using the boring operation to size them to you know, 0 0.501 so just one thousandths over half an inch for those dowel pins. So there wasn't much to this. The machine loved that cut. I mean nothing really to say there. Finally we move into just some chamfering and then here, what I'm showing is a thread mill operation. So this is how I save my pallet. So long story short is I tried to rigid tap with a one half 13 form tap, 500 RPM, which I think put me at around 38 inches per minute going, you know, 
three quarters of an inch into this material and essentially it stalled my spindle so you'll get to see that I feared that I had ruined the pallet and I wouldn't be able to use it because when I drilled these holes I drilled them for a form tap and all I had on hand at the time was a thread mill so what I did is I went ahead and just came back in here with a thread mill and then you know thread milled them to one half 13 and that worked obviously the thread engagement isn't ideal because the holes are slightly larger than they should have been but again that did save the pallet so you'll get to see that in the video as well of me just sort of messing up and stalling out my spindle and guys i gotta say pretty impressed with the machine so far i mean i am still in the honeymoon phase so i i made a bt30 fixture you might have seen me you know post this um on the Facebook group so I did mic this and in X and Y I was within five tenths so that is awesome I mean that's better than what I expected for my first cuts uh, I was a little off I was off by a couple thou and Z and that might have just been my Heimer setting or you know how I had it put in the vice for op to etc so again pretty pleased with the accuracy of the X7 so far and I love the the encoders I love not having to home the machine even though I, I do park the machine in the home position you know at the end of the day but again I just I love having those encoders so I don't have to home the machine it just saves time so I think that's it and so now what we'll do is we'll just go ahead and transition into videos of the machining I'm sure that's what you guys want to see and so I hope you enjoy and I'll catch you guys at the end of the video. Okay, so here we begin with our 3D adaptive clearing, half inch, three flute, helical end mill, 96 inches per minute, 50 thou with a cut, an inch and a quarter depth of cut. Way too ambitious. You can hear the spindle bulk down. Again, I was able to solve that by reducing the feed rate to around 50 inches per minute. Let me know what you think in the comments. All right, so here we are just doing the facing op with the three quarter of an inch Haas HEIN mill, 128 inches per minute, 50 thou depth of cut, half diameter of the tool for the width of cut. Again, we're just chewing up material here like there's no problems in the world. Like this tool so far. Again, let me know what you think in the comments. So here we are taking the large kin metal go drill again just sending it straight through an inch and a quarter material tell me what you think so there you hear it starts to bog down right as we get toward the end of the stock does that sound healthy let me know i think next time i want to reduce the speeds and feeds let me know what you guys think and sorry for the cell phone footage the flood coolant got all over the lens of my gopro Ruin that footage, so I'm trying to do the best with what I can. Show you guys the cuts and the feeds and speeds. Okay, here's where I stall my spindle, trying to rigid tap one half 13 holes with a forum tap 500 RPM 65.4 SFM. Scared me, but everything turned out okay. All right, so here the pallet is finished. After the rigid, rigid tapping fell, so I was able to go ahead and just thread all four holes with the thread mill and everything turned out fine. I was a little worried because I did drill the holes for a form tap, but everything looks fine. I was only able to dig up two one half 13 screws so i need to figure out what i did with my through my screws and then i did make holes for four dowel pins like you can see here but i'm only using two dowel pins at the moment one in each corner uh, in a diagonal fashion i have my hymer there so i wanted to show you guys if i can try to sweep this in x it's hard to sweep and film at the same time there we go so as you can see the dial indicator does not move 
and I've swept it, you know, from left to right all the way. So I'm happy with the way that this turns out turned out so now I can go ahead and use my Saunders mod vices while still using the Pearson palette and I haven't decided yet I do have another design where I can mount my Kurt DX4 but I'm thinking for now the mod vices will suit my needs so that's it and I'll catch you guys in the next video